different phrases I use regularly throughout the business is nobody has the mortgage or knowledge. And I think the minute that you want to act like a startup that have the scale and, you know, the infrastructure of a large organization. a really powerful thing. If you can turn up every day and feel like I, I don't just have a share in this business, but I actually am an owner in this business. It's quite a different mental attitude. Welcome to The Business Of, brought to you by the Australian Graduate School of Management. As we continue to cast a light on adaptive leadership and the ability to recover from a crisis, we now turn our attention to the financial services sector. For many in the industry, 2020 was to be a year focused on restoring public trust after the findings of the Hain Royal Commission. Instead, a new crisis arrived in the form of COVID-19 and supporting customers through the subsequent economic downturn and financial hardship became an all-embracing priority. We begin this episode with Rob Adams, CEO and Managing Director at Perpetual, a leading Australian investment and financial advice firm. Rob explores how the core value of trust plays an invaluable role in adaptive leadership, internal and external relationships, and business success. Also joining me is Susanna Ruskevsky, Chief Marketing Officer at National Australia Bank. Susanna shares her insights into how they've continued to support and serve their customers while navigating a strategic and cultural transformation, all in the midst of a pandemic. And lastly, we'll hear from Dan Peters, Chief Revenue Officer at fintech disruptor LimePay. I talked to Dan about the speed of decision-making that's required in a startup and how that plays out during a crisis. First, let's go to my conversation with Rob Adams. Rob, welcome to The Business Of. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate your invitation. So it has been challenging for the last six months and trust sits at the core of Perpetual's uh, relationships with your customers. How have you managed this period through this volatile time? Yeah, you're right. Uh, on all fronts there, I mean, it's been a volatile time and, and trust does sit at the core of our relationships with our, with our clients at Perpetual. And to be honest, we make a bit of a noise of that. We, you know, there's an important phrase we use in a perpetual, and that is that trust is earned. And we truly believe that, that uh, you know, we earn our trust of our clients every day through, through every action. We never assume that, that we have trust with our clients, and we constantly want to retest that. And difficult, you know, volatile investment market conditions and economic conditions provide that retesting moment, if you like. So, you know, we remind our people at Perpetual that, you know, we, we do earn that trust every day and that in particularly difficult times when people are uncertain, uh, when there is volatility around, you know, that uh, volatility creates information gaps and we have to fill those information gaps more in, in volatile times than in normal times. And so, you know, one of our mantras we've added, you know, since the COVID-19 crisis really started to hit is to double down on communications with our clients. So we've been doubling down both in shape and form and, you know, accessing and emphasizing different forms of communication, given we're all so technologically led and digitally led these days, doubling down on comms, using technology you know, wisely and getting information to people in a timely and relevant manner. And that helps reduce you know, those information gaps that therefore, you know, hopefully helps us to maintain a trusted relationship with our clients. Your purpose and that trust has guided that. But even for the best of leaders, it challenges us. What did you look for in your leadership team to lead during this? And what were the most successful attributes that you saw? Yeah, I'd like to say it was exactly the same attributes that we would display as leaders in the normal course of business. But I think the difficult times um, you know, can create difficult, different reactions from different people. It's important and, and you know, we're fortunate that yeah, most of our leadership team have been through yeah, a crisis moment before. Unfortunately, in our own working careers, we've seen too many once in a hundred year events, haven't we? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think yeah, to, to now experience maybe three or four one in a hundred year events, that positions as well as an experienced leadership team to know yeah, what really comes to the fore during these difficult times. I mean, certainly for me, yeah, something I've been keen to impress upon our leadership team has been calmness is a really important thing leadership casts a pretty big shadow 
and people watch and learn, even subliminally or in a subconscious sort of, sort of a manner. So I think being calm, making sure you don't overreact to the first piece of information, but getting the fullness of information before you might make a decision, that's, that's been pretty, pretty important. And a big learning for me personally out of the GFC in particular, and something that I've been impressing upon our leadership team uh, as much as I can, is uh, that you need to really only focus on what you can control. There are plenty of important things in what we do, particularly in financial services, that impact our success or failure, but we can't control them. And the direction of investment markets is one of those things. Yeah, it's really easy to be obsessed by looking at screens and numbers. And you know, I know people who uh, you know, want to be woken up every hour throughout the middle of the night to see how certain securities might be performing. That get, I, I think that can really get you wound up in the wrong sort of way. So really focus on what you can control and try and be calm in your decision-making process. Another really important thing I think for our leadership team has been you know, to make sure that you trust your people. Sometimes in difficult times, volatility, thing, you know, charts going the wrong way, financials of the business going the wrong way, uh, sometimes that trust can be tested. You know, people start to second guess things a little bit more. But you know, we've, we've hired our people for a reason. They're tried and tested individuals. Let's trust them just as much as we would in ordinary times, in more difficult times. And I think through empowering people in that way, showing that you have confidence, showing that you trust them, I think um, uh, becomes contagious in the business. So yeah, that's been a really important thing for us. Another thing I would say that you know, we've tried to stress a lot throughout the last few months has been really having a, you know, a deliberate and obvious uh, pulse check on a regular basis. Recently, we had Are You OK Day, but I think in this sort of environment, you know, we need to be asking our people, are they OK, far more regularly. And I think retesting and re-asking that question. I had an interesting conversation with one of our senior people in Melbourne not so long ago, and of course, Melbourne has had their second lockdown, and that's really been a big issue for a lot of people from a mental health and wellbeing perspective. And in conversations with this one particular senior person, I asked, asked her how she was doing. And I got a pretty political response. She was trying to sound tough, but I could just tell that I needed to ask the question a couple more times, which I did in that that phone call. And then we spoke for 45 minutes. And I think it was um, important just to retest that initial answer. So those, those pulse checks with our people are really, really important. I'd f maybe wrap, it, wrap up the answer to that important question by saying, Wrapping up all of those things, I think, is showing that you have a genuine care, you know, that you really do care for the relationship with your customers, with your clients, and you really do care about how your people or how your your clients are going. And I think, yeah, that aspect of just being genuine and fair income about things makes a real difference. How has technology been accelerated to help your organisation? And do you see that being something that will continue to be as rapidly adopted? Like, what are you thinking about that and change and, and serving customers and employees? I'm sure you've seen the, the multiple choice question, Emma, that uh, says, who was most responsible for the technology revolution <laughs> at your company? You know, was it the CIO, the CEO, um, or COVID-19? Uh, COVID <laughs> and I reckon, I reckon we're all ticking the third box, right? Uh, um, good things come out of difficult times. And I think, um, you know, Perpetual, we're no, no different to many other firms. And to be totally frank, I, I would say, you know, with weeks weeks until the shutdown, you know, we had concerns about our ability to totally mobilise our workforce and to take a 1,000 people, you know, from the office and have them work remotely. But our IT team worked incredibly well, incredibly hard um, and with great partners and we got it done and it actually was really seamless. You know, one of my personal reflections on that is that, um, uh, you know, if absent a crisis, if we as a management team said, hey, to our technology guys, hey, guys, we've got a new project. We want to work out exactly how we can mobilise our workforce and, you know, have full functionality from a thousand different locations. My guess is we probably would have called it a project. We would have given it a name. We would have appointed a project manager. We put, would have put all this shape and form around it, given it a budget. And in nine months' time, we might have come up with a reasonable response. So, yeah, I guess yeah, a big learning for, for me and I think for our business is to say, yeah, when, when you take away some of the bureaucracy of structure, which is there for important reasons, yeah, but just have an attitude of getting something done because it has to, it's remarkable what you can achieve.
what do you think the role for financial services in leading that type of change or transformation for customers? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, back to you know, one of your opening questions, Emma, we, we're talking about trust and the need to provide information to information in a timely and relevant way, you know, making it easier for people to access information and making it easier for people to do business with, with you. I think that you know, they need to be themes that are at the forefront of people's minds. And within that, really standing in, in the shoes of our clients, our customers and our prospective clients and customers, uh, and yeah, yeah, using their language and not our language. I think this industry, financial services industry, is obsessed with three-letter acronyms and complications and jargon that actually just makes most people roll their eyes and say, well, I just don't know. Um, we, can, we can easily cut through. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, I think about some of our most successful communications in the last six months have been when we've had senior people who are technically incredibly strong people who are talking to their clients in a plain English, simple way, we're open for Q&A, we'll take any questions in any shape or form and, and we'll respond in a way that makes sense to people. So I think we've just, I think financial services needs to be more relatable, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and I think we've learned through the requirement to be incredibly transparent, that timely and relevant communications through different mediums. I think we, we as an industry, you know, have hopefully learned that we need to do more of that. And that needs to be a permanent feature of our landscape. I, I think that's a, a really critical aspect of our forward-looking learnings. So what do you hope in terms of the shape of your organisation? How do you keep them ready? Who do you hire? How do you maybe reskill? What are you looking for? when you, you imagine the perfect workforce to, to arm you and keep the you... perfect workforce. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I mean, we what, what is it, right? It. <laughs> what do they say? Business would be great if you didn't have to manage people. I don't believe that at all. Um, you know, pe- people are our business. People, you know, you, know, um, you know, I'm in business because of the people stories that you're able to impact, right? And those people stories you can tell for the rest of your life. It's, it's immensely rewarding. From Perpetual's perspective, again, one important thing that you know, we've had as front of mind is that the old Churchillian phrase that you should never wait or waste a good crisis. And within a crisis, if you have the courage and, and commitment and alignment, yeah, um, you can do good things. Yeah, we, we've uh, executed two offshore transactions. One of them is a transformational acquisition for, for Perpetual, um, uh, by some margin, the largest transaction we've ever undertaken in our 130, 30-year history. And we've done that you know, through pretty difficult times and I think it's you know when when you're able to show that sort of long-term vision you know that light light at the hill um, then it, it starts to attract the right sort of people I think and that's important and I think by you know the behaviors we've shown as a, as, as a management team uh, in being able to do extremely positive and transformative things you know, for our business during this time I think gives people a feel for the sort of organisation we are becoming. Perpetual at its heart is a, has a terrific brand, a terrific heritage, uh, and yet yeah, we're in the act of positively reinventing ourselves for, you know, for, for, the, for the next 50 and 100 years, and I think that attracts a certain sort of person. And we've certainly seen that in, in recent weeks post the announcement of, of the larger transaction. So, you know, I think people who can share in that vision, who are happy to be courageous within sensible parameters, who want to be empowered, but most of all, who just want to make a difference. You know, I, I often draw the metaphor in business of together we're building, we're, we're building a structure and we've got mortar and we've got bricks and we're slapping a bit of mortar on the brick and building this structure. And we might not know exactly what that structure looks like, but we know on every brick that we've put in, you know, if we've written our name and the date and it'll stand there forevermore. And, and I think for people who want to have that feeling of relative, positive relative impact, of building something that will stand the test of time, when they see the actions of a group like ours you know, through, through difficult times, then I think um, if they can be inspired by those things, then they're the sorts of people we, we want. You tell great stories. I'm hearing it already. Is that part of your secret in leadership, do you think? Like how do you, when you look at your own start of leadership, how do you describe it? That's an embarrassing question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't often like talking about myself, and uh, to, to be frank, um, I'm going to rephrase your question, Emma. You can. What <laughs> styles of leadership in others do I admire um, mm-hmm. okay. and, and aspire to? Um, you know, I, I think leadership by example is 
Absolutely, yeah, head and shoulders above anything else. Yeah, I think you set the tone for the organisation or the tone for your team. Yeah, so I think I think setting the example in everything you do in terms of you know, the way you communicate, the way you in, interact with people, that genuine care that I talked about earlier, setting the tone is incredibly important. So leadership by example is a standout. I think yeah, transparency and openness come along with that. I think about definitions of the way you work. It's not about the hours that you spend. It's about the output and the quality of the output and being focused on that output. Um, being able to bring people with you is really important. I'd say my standout quality that I seek in others is leadership by example. For the benefit, I guess, of people who might not have done those types of acquisitions that you said that, you know, they're these big transactions that you've undertaken, how do you ensure when you, you're doing that that you you the culture and what you set as your ultimate goal, how does how do you make that work? It's a really important question. In looking at any acquisition opportunity in financial services and specifically um, uh, in relation to the two transactions we've recently announced in asset management, uh, but I think I think the same applies in any aspect of financial services because almost all financial services activities are the major asset you're acquiring is people, and therefore the cultural test that has to take place is the most important test. You know, we can count the assets, we can count the revenue, we can have a best guess as to the opportunity in a forward-looking sense, but if the people aren't on the same page, then you know, you're fundamentally going, going to have a problem. I think in particular in asset management and probably advice as well. The cultural audit, and we do, effect, we do actually do a formal cultural audit, is really important, and that's just a reflection of how you feel culturally about your interactions with the other side. And that's not to say that yeah, everybody's the same and if, unless you think in a certain manner, it's not going to work because you know the worst outcome you could have is group think. But I think just assure, ensuring that you know, fundamentally people are driven by similar things is important. I think secondly, it's really important to think in a forward-looking sense to, to say if our businesses come together, here's what we're going to do and this is what you know, the other side's going to do and this is how we're going to come together. Yeah, so agreeing the rules of the forward-looking game um, up front is really important. Understanding who's going to do what, where the value is going to be added, and then calling each other on that. And then the other thing I would throw into this, and this might sound almost trivial, but you know, I think testing that in a in your business environment through due diligence meetings, yeah, you know, through countless meetings uh, face to face is is so important. But then it's equally important to do things off piste. Yeah, you know, to be in a social setting and to really understand what people's drivers are on a personal basis as well. And I think when you can tick all those boxes, I think you're in good shape from a cultural foundation perspective as you bring teams together, particularly disparate teams. The trans the larger transaction we announced back on the 27th of July was is uh, you know 100 people based in Dallas. And we won't be able to get to Dallas for some time and they won't be able to get to Sydney for some time. But um, yeah, luckily we did all of that cultural you know, pre-testing and analysis work pre-COVID and we can call each other you know, on those cultural promises and commitments, um, albeit electronically, we have that base now. So it is the most important thing. And probably where also a lot of organisations could get it wrong. So it's good. It sounds like the more you put up front the more likely the outcome will be a positive one. So if, if you don't mind going back to technology and disruption and, I mean, fintech in Australia has had an amazing kind of investment and there's all sorts of companies popping up everywhere. Do you see innovation driving into Perpetual more so, something you'll look to some of those partnerships or acquisitions? It's interesting. In, in Perpetual, um, we have three businesses and one of them is a corporate trust business. The, you know, where we are trustee for effectively the securitization industry in Australia. In that privileged position, you know, we have access to line-by-line -line mortgage data of you know, pretty much the entire Australian marketplace. And through an acquisition we completed about 20 months ago, you know, we acquired a lot of additional debt data, non-mortgage debt data. So we have this incredibly rich data source, which is a privileged position to be in because it's through the provision of the trustee activities that you're there. And you know, we, have, we have been able to um, you know, utilise that data in a um, uh, manner that's entirely secure, uh, where we have created a whole bunch of analytical tools for financial services organisations to do a whole range of risk assessment and regulatory reporting. So within Sleepy, you know, a Sleepy trustee business, we've developed this 
terrific little data as a service operation that is now producing material revenue for us. So yeah, we actually have an example you know, within our corporate trust business that's a combination of being born from within because smart people invested in the right technology you know, ahead of time saw, saw the potential for this to happen, which is now happening. And we've augmented that through an acquisition. So yeah, that's an example of both those things, you know, thinking from within and without coming together to you know, produce something that we think over time will become quite material for the group. Who'd have thought, you know, a technology company and a sleepy trustee company that's actually making money. <laughs> that's the thing in technology, actually making money. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, yeah, we, we're on the constant search for that sort of potential to unlock it from within our business. There are other parts of our business, say, in our asset management functions where yeah, I think we yeah you know, we need to invest more in utilising data to improve our deci- our own decision making. We're seeing uh, yeah some of the interesting fintech startups, particularly uh, out of Europe, where asset management businesses who rely solely on artificial intelligence are making active decisions and becoming competitors in the asset management space. Uh, so you know we need to be prepared for the shape and form of our competitors to be changing uh, and to ensure that we are using data in the same way, but with more human interaction to improve our decision making. So yeah, I think there are there there are loads of applications for technology, loads of application for data. So I think you know we need to be a rich source of data. We need to be interrogating and utilizing that in in a secure and responsible manner and using it to improve our own decision making and using it to improve clients' decision making as well. I think to your point, it's the questions you ask of it and and maybe the courage to act on it, but be driven by your purpose. I'm hearing a strong learner profile in you. You talk a lot about your own learning and, you know, um, even the way you're you're suggesting the questions that you ask, how important is that ultimately to your organisation and to your leadership team? Having a, a learning attitude, if you like. Yeah, I feel like I'm hearing it from you. No, you're a good reader. That's true. I mean, I, th- I think that's one of the joys of this industry. Um, you know, I've been in the game for asset management game or financial services broadly. I think my, this is my 33rd year, one third of a century. That's frightening. And and yeah, every day I've learned something. And I think that's inspiring. Yeah, you know, that's terrific. You know, how, how lucky are we to be in a position where you'll never come close to knowing everything? One of my favorite phrases I use regularly throughout the business is nobody has the mortgage on knowledge. And I think the minute that you assume you do, uh, you get a bit too big for your boots and that creates a different set of problems down the track. So, you know, um, it's, I'm glad you've picked up on that. That's, uh, that's, that's something that's dear to my heart is learning um, uh, from everybody around you. And, you know, it, it's not as if, you know, I as a chief executive can only learn from other chief executives or my executive committee or my board. I'll learn from anybody. You know, I spent an hour today with one of our IT service desk uh, guys on a particularly painful mobile phone problem. And I just learned so much about how these things operate that I didn't know before. Rob, because the listeners of, of the business of, they, lo- they learn, you've given so many great insights into the way you lead and the opportunities and how fast I think Perpetual saw those opportunities to move fast. What else would you say to other organisations who are managing change or going through a crisis to help them stay open to what may be and be comfortable with it. I guess it, yeah, whatever I might be about to say, I just yeah, take with a grain of salt because you know, everybody will apply their own views and aspects of what I might say to their own their, their, their own situation. I mean, I, I think you just you've got to be open to change, prepared to change, and prepared. I think prepared to move quickly uh, in order to get the best out of that change, which means you're taking risk generally. Whenever there is change, there's risk, but you can't be afraid of risk. You've got to embrace it, understand it, recognize it, and use it for good, not bad. You know, Uh, I think um, we're very fortunate, Perpetual, to have a chief risk officer um, who I brought into the business, who I've worked with before, who has had a serious impact on the way that I think about risk and risk management. Uh, It's not to be avoided, it's to be embraced. And yeah, I think with the right dose of courage thrown in, as long as you're certain of your long-term direction, and when I say certain of your long-term direction, that's yeah, you know, it's the old chart that says, "Well, this is where we're heading," and you can define where it, where that is, but you know that your path is going to be a zigzag. It's not going to be linear. 
and accepting that it's going to be a zigzag and accepting that some of the things that happen in the short term you know, might not align with that long-term direction you have, but being prepared to respond accordingly, reassess, take on risk, adjust. And within that, I think, being be totally prepared and comfortable with being wrong. You know, I think that's a big thing. I think sometimes people, particularly as they start to climb the leadership ranks, think that being wrong is a problem and think that being wrong might stymie their success or their future potential. I absolutely don't believe that. I'm wrong every day. And I think it's really important to be able to say you're wrong, explain why, and to explain your, learning, explain your learnings and to be better the next time. I remember an old adage from the 1970s when Canon was one of the most progressive companies on the planet. And yeah, one of their management mantras was, if you're not making enough mistakes, you're not making enough decisions. And I think it's yeah, that's one of those things that sort of you know I, I think about quite regularly. Now there's there's obviously limits to that, and if you s- keep making the same mistake over and over, well that that is a problem um, because you haven't learned. Um, but I think showing a preparedness to to back to back you yourself, to back your people, being open to getting decisions wrong, I would say be prepared to make decisions when you think you are seventy five percent or eighty percent of the way there. You know, trying to extract the last 20% to be certain of a decision generally takes a lot longer, will cost you a lot more, and it'll mean you miss out on a lot in terms of the opportunity. So be prepared to, again, in a risk-adjusted way, um, make decisions when you're about 80% of the way there. Rob, you've given so many amazing insights. Thank you for joining us today on The Business Of. It's a pleasure, Emma. Thanks so much for your time. This is The Business Of, a podcast looking at what it means to do well and do good in the world of business. A fantastic conversation with Rob Adams. His humility as a leader, the principles of trust and transparency, and the commitment to always be learning really shone through. It's something that's proved to be so valuable for leading his teams and stakeholders throughout his career. Next, let's hear from Susanna Brzezewski, Chief Marketing Officer at National Australia Bank, on how she's built an organisational culture that adapts to change with a bias for action. Susanna, welcome to The Business Of. Thank you for having me. So I should I should declare we've worked together many, many, many years ago mm-hmm. and it's been wonderful to see just how far that you have grown and tell me how your leadership journey's gone and how do you define it today? You know, if I think about myself as a leader, I'd hope that I'd got better over the years. I have got better over the years. With experience, there does come, you know, lots of learnings, but it's interesting. There are some things that I've held true to from day one you know, when I first started my career that really stick by me and there's things that I've learned along the way. What I would say is as a leader, I I do feel like collaboration and context are probably the two most important things that I've carried through with me. And why do I say that? Collaboration, goodness, whether you work in a big organisation or a small organisation and no matter how many people you have got under your direct leadership, There is this constant need to be able to influence, understand and collaborate across the business, particularly in the marketing sense. Like we can't do what we do on our own. We have to be working with the technology teams, our people team, operations, the product teams. Um, So that's the first point. You've got to be able to gather context and collaborate across the value chain so that you can make the right business decisions. I had um, a previous boss who said to me, context adds 100 points of IQ. And I really do think that is the case. And from a leadership perspective, that is something that I've carried with me just because I think a certain way or I tackle a challenge or even the way I lead is the way I lead. It doesn't mean that that's the way people want to be led or that's the way other people lead. So gather context, listen, try and have some fun along the way. I'd like to think that um, people have got a sense of me as a human being as well as me in the workforce. And I do think as a leader I do spend a significant amount of time trying to understand where my team are at personally as well as professionally. 
and then had that pandemic thrown in just just to to further challenge and including particularly in Melbourne, uh, not even being able to have your team in front of you. How has that changed or been different in driving change to then dealing with driving change, having to deliver and having these additional kind of challenges? Well, let me give you some context (laughs) because it's not just a pandemic that's been thrown at us um, in the last six months. So, you know, I'm at NAB at the moment. I run the marketing function. Just prior to COVID, we had a new CEO, CEO come in, Ross McEwen. We came on the back of the Royal Commission, a strategic transformation within NAB, a cultural transformation, all redesign, strategy refreshes and a pandemic. So overnight, literally 300 people in my team, let alone, you know, probably 20,000 people, were like, you're now working from home. So none of this corridor conversation or meetings in the office or the interactions that you get, we had to overnight do all of our business over Zoom. And what an extraordinary situation that was because you go, well, one, can we actually do this over Zoom? And it was extraordinary to see the whole organisation tilt overnight. And I was so super proud of NAB to be able to do that. We had to make sure that we could continue running the operation from home. We were getting as many phone calls in three weeks as we did in a year, you know, 650,000 inbound calls over a two-week period, which is really what we expect to get over a year. So I think, you know, be agile, (laughs) flex, you know, be gutsy enough to be able to say, all right, this needs direction. The clarity, if you think about leadership, there's kind of, you know, three things that we should offer up our teams Clarity, make sure everyone understands what they need to do, where they fit. Train them, capability, make sure that they've got the tools and the training to make sure they are capable to do their jobs and motivation. We really tilt the clarity piece up front. You know, up front, I had to change the marketing plan overnight. We had bought our media 12 months in advance. We had our plan literally overnight. We're like, go. So with that, That was fascinating because we said, right, let's set some principles. We don't have time here to review the marketing plan, go deep into the media plans, review our CVPs, what proof points have we got. We gave principles and we said, here are the five principles. Focus on customers first, above prospects. Support our customers. Make sure they understand what is available for, for them from our perspective, the business relief packages that the government's offering, the work that the banks are doing to support them digital adoption, how do they actually keep safe? And then we let them go. We gave them a budget. We said, here are the things to do, off you go. And the team was extraordinary. You had to adapt that style, that approach, maybe that empowerment, fast decision-making, probably removal of some of the processes. You said normally you'd go through that approval process around plans. Is there anything you think you've learnt or you would take because it proved to be more effective moving forward? Yeah, all of it. And it's not like we didn't know it before. There are times in your career where you just like it just hits you right in the face and you go, of course, that's what I should be doing. (laughs) That's what we should all be doing. So even before, like, and and our CEO has been very public about this. You know, we had over 400 projects in place and the backlog was huge. It was going to take us an extended period of time to get through this. Here are the top 20 guys. These are the ones that you're accountable for. And then the pandemic, like once you have less things to do and you're really clear about those things, it's amazing how quickly you can get these things done. But this real desire to kind of get out there, trial stuff, give it a go in a safe way, I want to hold on to that forever. Like that's, you know, that, that's what you want to hold on to. You're still driving a massive digital transformation, customer empowerment kind of uh, a program. How are you going to drive that change in that new way that you're going to work? So, look, digital transformation is something that we're always wanting to do and it's because our customers want that from us. You know, we were um, really encouraged to do the right thing by our customers because what they wanted was help me bank online. And, again, it went back to the focus. So we've already done that. Like if I think about some of the stats, our internet banking registrations were up 35% in the first month. The behavioural change, we supported that with here is how you do it. And, you know, behaviourally, I think customers, now that they know how to use digital, the, the apps and then doing more stuff online, 
it's unlikely that they're likely to go back to do the things that they used to do in the branch that they can now do. So the, the journey has started. You know, people are less likely to use cash. They're more likely to lose online. And that's really propelled us to just continue that journey. So some feedback we've heard and, you know, um, the psychology behind customers is that, you know, they're looking more to values and trust, you know, could they trust their organisation at time of crisis? What's your view of that for how what you've observed? Has it been different? Are they challenging you in different ways? Or is it more the mindset of the organisation that's adapting to that? Well, our purpose, as part of our strategic refresh, we had another look at our purpose and it, it was tilted, but I really love the words. And the words are around serve our customers and our community. Um, So it does start from the very top in terms of our purpose as a bank is to serve our customers and our community. If you start there, the decisions you make around, well, how do you serve? You have to respond to what customers needs. And, you know, it it was actually helpful for us. And it's an awful thing to say. And I don't, you know, no one wants a pandemic. But post the Royal Commission, where trust was, you know, decreased significantly because we weren't serving our customers. And that wasn't because people were purposefully trying to destroy value or we were (laughs) trying to do the wrong thing. But you've got this huge organisation where the left hand needs to talk to the right hand. There's technology platforms that have been there in years and processes and things. We have to navigate our way through that. But, you know, you have COVID. It gave us the opportunity to go back to the say-do ratio of 100%. We are going to be here to support you. We are going to serve you. We are going to help you get through this. And we are also going to do things like, uh, and I don't know if you've seen any of our recent activity, but helping you does not mean saying yes in every instance. There may be times actually where we will not be able to lend to you because you're not in a position to be able to pay for it. And really encouraging our customers to get come to us very early so that we can have those conversations, um, have a look at their cash flow before it's too late. So COVID gave us a chance to improve our say-do ratio. It gave us a chance to rebuild trust. And we know, like there's lots of stats there that, you know, I think there was one stat that I saw the other day that two in three people say that the way a brand responds during a crisis will impact their likelihood of um, transacting with that brand in the future. And we're certainly seeing that, you know, our strategic NPS has improved significantly, reputation has improved. So this isn't just a bank thing, it's those big brands that are really tilted to supporting customers that have seen an increase in reputation and trust. Which which is wonderful to hear. How, how Actually, just curious, how often are you testing that? Is that a monthly check that you're keeping track of or quarterly? Yeah, so we, we track trust and reputation. We track everything monthly. And, you know, there's obviously levers. Diff, different organisations have got different ways of measuring. And what is it that you measure? You know, the levers into strategic NPS around trust and reputation service plays a significant part of that as well. So this desire to keep the simple things, you know, the digital adoption and being able to service them simply in an easy way also plays into that. How do you view technology? Is that the cause for strategic change? I mean, technology should be an enabler. And I think sometimes we can get caught up in the shiny new technology and actually forget about what's the business challenge that you're trying to solve for. And, you know, like, again, I'm in marketing. I could spend hours and hours and hours thinking about what is the best marketing tech stack. But really, I should be spending hours and hours and hours going, what is it that my customers need? What are our value propositions? How are we going to service them? Now, there's pros and cons of working in a big organisation versus a small organisation. It's always interesting talking to people because, you know, if I talk to someone that's in a startup, they're very envious of a big corporate who, you know, perceivingly has more budgets, more funding, more people, (laughs) Um, and that's true, but it's never enough. Whereas we look very fondly at startups and go, goodness, they're quick. They can steer the ship really quickly. And I think the secret is to not be envious, (laughs) but take advantage of what what you have as your, you know, if you're in a startup, we want to act like a startup that have the scale and, you know, the infrastructure of a large organisation. Like that's where the magic is. And with that, you know, again, I think it goes back to 
be really clear on what business challenges you're trying to solve in order of priority. Has the way you've shaped your organisation changed over the years? And then how do you imagine that's going to continue to change into the future? It definitely has. We have access to new tools and those new tools are technology and, you know, data and artificial intelligence and bots. And, of course, we would take into account those things and try and take advantage of those things to build out differentiated and value propositions. So my team, of course, like, you know, 20 years ago, when we worked together, I remember setting up the first website. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, you know, whereas now we've got people in the team that are actually tech expert, marketing tech experts that know how to do programmatic buys, that um, are using bots, that are looking at WhatsApp, Messenger. Like we're, we're absolutely taking advantage of the new technology that is in place. But the way we approach it, like some of that stuff doesn't change. You know, you go back to the fundamentals of marketing. What are your objectives? Who's your target audience? What's your value proposition? And how are you going to execute? Maybe the how you execute has changed somewhat. But not necessarily how you want to make your customer feel, right? The empowerment, that's, that's, that's been the same. It's just different ways. But this is the thing. And almost you, you've got to be, you know, it's the whole marketing has always been about art and science, some organisations try and tilt too far on the science end um, and, you know, forget about the importance of emotional attachment to a brand, which I think always anchor yourself in what is it that the customer wants and, and you know, what are you going to deliver to? What are your, what's your strategic capabilities and your assessment of where do you want to play is a really good anchor for marketers and, in fact, business overall. What are the characteristics? You know, what do you look for? How do you probe around that to make sure that you do have someone that, that's future-proofed, <laughs> maybe for want of a better word? Curiosity, first and foremost. What I probe on is desire and evidence of have you been learning along the way? Because, you know, we're never not going to, we're going to have to continue learning. And, you know, if I think about the things that I've had to learn in the last three or four years that I would never cover off at university... <laughs> In this day and age, right, like you, you've almost got different types of CMOs and you, you can have depth and breadth, but you've got, and it really depends on how you line up with the business strategy and the culture of the organisation. I think cultural fit actually has a huge part to play and how does this person fit in in an overall leadership team? So, for instance, in financial services, there are a lot of people that know financial services, <laughs> a lot of financial services experts. Now, of course, people will say it's wonderful to have financial services experience in marketing. But in this, in this environment, I'm really open to new industry segments, you know, exposure to different kinds of customer segments because that will add something different to the organisation and um, allows you an expertise that can help lift the whole organisation. So I'm looking for where does this person fit in in the overall leadership team? Will they learn? And have they got a capacity to be thinking about teams, not themselves, but, you know, evidence of have they been able to build up their team and push them through the system? There's nothing more satisfying than seeing someone that's worked for you pop up somewhere 10 years later, like where their career is just, you know, phenomenally grown. And I think one of those common traits amongst people is the motivation and curiosity. Another theme we talk to a lot is how you can pursue goals of doing well and doing good. What's your view and how are you keeping that in balance? How do you get that tension right to you want to serve the community, but you also need to deliver the results? Yeah, it is interesting, but I don't think, like, it's an interesting question. And, I, and I, I'm going to be controversial and say, why do we ask it? Because if you come back with, what is it that you are here for? If you don't do well by your customers, you won't do well by your financial performance. It is okay in corporate to go, this is what customers want. And I do do that. I go in and we go, what is it the customer wants? And I'm completely agnostic to NAB to start with. Be very purist and democratise what is it that the customers are looking for. Start there. Then you run your strategic capabilities on what can you deliver versus the competitors and what can you deliver can be a what's the cost, um, can I actually deliver that, 
And that's where I think that the magic is on well and good. The, the magic on well and good is find out what customers want, but be honest around what are your strategic capabilities and your ability to deliver on that. And one of the metrics can be, well, if we can't afford it or it's going to cost us too much and you know, we're not going to make any money out of it, then find something that you can do um, to service them. And it sounds very purist, but if we always start with, you know, either be financially driven or either do what the customer wants, you're never going to get to the right answer. You've got to meet somewhere in the middle and that somewhere in the middle is balanced scorecard. Are you meeting your customers' needs? Have you got the strategic capabilities? Can you invest in that? Can you make money on that? I think it's that middle part with a balanced scorecard that actually helps you get to the right answers. It sounds like you're you're leading with the right questions and answers and potentially managing expectations. Do you think some organisations make their timelines too tight? Leadership is very responsible for balancing short-term and long-term. And, you know, they get to drive what the objectives are and make sure that they are thinking about short-term and long-term um, without doubt. And it's it's been fabulous at NAB to actually see our CEO come in. He's very clear. It's customers, it's colleagues, and if we do that right, we will meet our shareholder expectations. And that is driven very much from the top. So, Susanna, finally, what excites you about the future? What are you thinking about next? I am actually proud of the organisation. I'm proud of my team. What we had was a real sense of joint purpose. There wasn't one person that wasn't aware of what we were trying to achieve and that was actually for the good of the community and the good of our customers. And again, we knew it, but just this sense of purpose and what people are doing can really help push through the changes that need to be changed, motivate our teams. So that would be the first thing, really making sure everyone's clear and aligned on the purpose. Two, just reminding each other that we're human, like we were forced to. We're we're looking at people's lounge rooms and kids running around in the back and the rest of it. Like I think being a leader, and you've got to find your own style. Different people have got different styles. But it's actually okay to be human. And it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to say, I'm having a crappy day today because that all gives context. Susanna, what an inspiration. I know our listeners are going to get so much out of this. Thank you for joining us today on The Business Of. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. This podcast is brought to you by the Australian Graduate School of Management at UNSW Business School. What a transformative time for National Australia Bank. So valuable to hear those insights from Susanna on how the organisation is forging a way forward, putting customers first. I loved hearing her reflect on the instinctive curiosity we have as leaders and how it can play to our strengths during a crisis. My final guest for this episode is Dan Peters, Chief Revenue Officer at LimePay. Let's hear from Dan on what he's learned from the most disruptive period in recent history. Welcome to the business of Dan. Happy to be here. Tell me about Lime Pay and what attracted you to the business. Look, I'd, I'd spent 12 years at Google, all in Australia, and sort of felt like I was ready to take a step back into startup. Yeah, I mean, we can get into you know, some more of the, the principles of it, but effectively, it's just a really good disruption play and uh, and a very compelling proposition. And, and the hotter the, the buy now, pay later space gets, the more kind of compelling, I guess, the, the disruption looks from something like LimePay. So the combination, I guess, of, of just getting back into startup and doing something with that energy was very appealing. So you joined in January and then COVID hit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so talk about that. You leave the security of, you know, one of you know, the world's most successful companies for a startup just when a global pandemic hits doesn't necessarily <laughs> uh, strike you as the most sensible thing to do. And you, your wife does ask you a few hard questions at night about whether or not that was the right decision. Um, but it's very much proving to be. Um, we've we've kind of been able to to proceed unabated somewhat, which is uh, which is great. I think the the sort of countervailing factors, right? So the the slowdown in kind of the general business economy and general hesitancy is counterbalanced by the fact that, you know, we, we sort of really specialize in kind of e-commerce and online 
uh, transactions, which obviously has has boomed as a result of COVID. What are the characteristics and what are you doing that kind of drives that disruption and what do we learn about disruption when we're putting it to play? Yeah, it's been really interesting, actually. You know, I spent a lot of time talking to kind of the C-suite and boards of, of the biggest, you know, retailers in the country. And, you know, retail has been under pressure for, for a very long time. And I really got to get under the skin of that and what it means to to try and, and to be running effectively, you know, those businesses under extreme pressure of, of all of the kind of the forces at play, I guess, around digitization, digital disruption, and so on. You know, here at LimePay, I guess, we're kind of in the, in, in the same space in that, you know, we're, we're representing the digital disruption that's, that's taking place. And what, what I guess what I've observed is the response from, from the market and from the, the sort of brands that we talk to is that some look at the challenge and really embrace it and take it as an opportunity to move faster, do the things they know they need to do to sort of bite the bullet. And others don't, right? And others sort of really feel paralyzed uh, by it and, and sort of retreat and really try and defend. And it's, I guess I, I come from the, the spirit of, you know, attack being the best form of defense. And, you know, there's one brand that we've been working with, it's a, a brand called Aussie Strength. They're a, an online gym equipment manufacturer. And as you, you know, listeners may be aware, COVID has been a boom times for the home gym. And, you know, Aussie Strength literally can't get equipment fast enough. Like they, they've virtually sold out almost immediately. Things have gone pretty nuts, which is great for them. But they could have taken that you know, very much as an opportunity to slow down other development works, certainly not to embrace a thing like LimePay, a new payment solution and a new payment platform. But they actually did the opposite. And they actually kind of put their arms around it and really took it as an opportunity to, to change faster because they could see that this is going to represent an amazing opportunity going forward. And they should, now is actually the time to double down. Now is the time to really, if not now, then when, you know, <laughs> um, and, and if not you, then who? Where do you see this going? What's the opportunities right now and moving forward? From a line pay perspective, I guess what, what I would say is that you know, we operate in the payment space, right? So for those uh, who, who haven't come across this yet, we're, we're kind of an innovation in Australia and, and globally in that we're the first buy now, pay later and payment processing platform combined. And we're a white label solution. So we give big brands a, a white label opportunity to own that kind of solution. And I guess where this originates from in terms of the opportunity is that there's still a lot of disruption at play in the payment space and, and payments itself is suddenly becoming a transformational consumer experience. The one I love to cite is, um, is kind of Uber in this space, right? So one of the most transformational parts of the Uber experience is just getting out of the car and walking away, right? And you know, there is no payments. It's a completely frictionless payment experience. And that's kind of a magical moment, right? Like when you, when you do that, you kind of go, huh, like that's different. And, and, all of a sudden, your whole experience of the idea of payments is transformed in that moment. So when we talk to kind of merchants and retailers, you know, that's the kind of you know, consumer value proposition that we start to talk about. It's like you can actually truly make a transformational experience out of payments. And it can be for a consumer completely, it can completely transform the way in which you do business with the brand. And so I think a lot of brands are starting to think about that. How could this work for my fashion brand? How could this work for my, you know, my in-store experience? How could this work online in a completely frictionless way? What additional value might might we give in that in that experience? You know, could we roll loyalty in this into this in some new and innovative way? And all these kind of things can be uh, innovated on. So there's so much opportunity there, and you know, we've really only sort of scratched the surface. I think you know, payments has been a pretty commoditized space for a long time. It was, a, you know, and and then we're now starting to kind of really knock the top off that and, and discover what's underneath. I think. So you uh, hold the title of Chief Revenue Officer. First of all, describe what that role means and then, you know, what does leadership in this time of change also need to look like? To me, it just encapsulates, in my head, uh, sales and marketing uh, combined. So top-line growth, oversight over, over top-line revenue, I guess, is, is how I generally think about it. But given we're a relatively small startup and I'm, I'm sort of partnering with the the founder, CEO, and COO, we're all knee deep in everything uh, right now. So I can't absolve myself of the bottom line either. So I suppose it means all of those things. But I think over time, it will evolve to a, you know, a greater focus on on just deals, partnerships, sales, marketing, revenue, anything that's driving uh, top line growth is, is how I see it. And 
And then what does it mean, leadership? I don't think it means anything different to what leadership means anywhere else, right? I firmly believe that the leadership is not a thing. It's a practice. It's a, it's a behavior, you know, and it's taking responsibility for the way in which you show up every day. You know, it's a, it's a deep understanding that your attitude, behaviors, process impacts others in both a positive and negative way and, and really being super mindful aware and aware of that. There are many different styles of leadership that everyone knows, but I think for me, it's much more a mindfulness thing. It's much more about the awareness that every time you get out of the lift and walk through the doors into your office in, of the morning, that's leadership. You know, people look at you and decide whether or not, you know, you're pumped today or you're flat today or, you know, you're stressed today or you're relaxed, uh, all of those things. And, you know, you can, you can feel that in others and you feel that in yourself. And that, that to me is leadership. What do you think you're taking from a larger organisation into the environment you're in today, into startup, into yeah, this need to, yeah. to, to sort of operate quickly without that big team and structure behind you? If you've been inside that organisation for a very long time, that's how you think business is done, right? And so you just get exposed to that and it's in- incredibly normalising. And then you get outside it for the first time, you get into you know another business and you go, wow, actually, I, I actually know a few things. <laughs> um uh, you know, I kind of know stuff that other people don't know. Uh, that's a, that's news. And I, you know, I've operated at a pretty reasonable level. That's quite valuable. We can put this to work, you know, whether it be legal negotiation, whether it be awareness of commercial environment, whether it be understanding of how product development's done. The, the watch out for me, which everyone calls out is, you know, can you still operate without a big team under you and all that stuff? And so that kind of, you wake up every day and go, you know, metaphorically roll the sleeves up and just think, okay. There isn't anyone else to do those edits to that document. There, there you go. No one's no one's cooking me lunch in the in the canteen. But let's just let's just park all that. It doesn't matter. And and it's time to do it for yourself. And that's actually been great fun. Like I just within a couple of weeks here, we were moving into an office, and I was building this cubicle, a soundproof cubicle. I was busy putting the pieces together. And I, I what I loved it. <laughs> it was great. It, it's kind of that sense of getting back to being on the tools and actually really being useful is you know it, it can be. One of the downsides of being in big corporate, and a lot of people I think would identify with this, is you become, you get further and further away from the, the manufacture of things, from the tools, whether it's wherever it is, whatever it is you're doing, from the product itself, from the decisions themselves. And it's incredibly empowering to suddenly be in a place where, you know, if you want to go and build the cubicle, you build the cubicle. If you want to write, you know, edit the legal document before you send it to the lawyers, you edit the document. And, you know, it's all of a sudden you're, you're empowered to do all this stuff. So I found it incredibly uh, energizing, reinvigorating, all the things I wanted from my from my move. So, I think the other thing which uh, you, you commented on is, you know, chief revenue officer, you know, typically plays at the top line, but in the startup you're considering every dollar uh, because part of strategy is staying in the game to win. Correct. Yep. What else have you seen? What are you doing that you think is different now that you're seven months in to maybe what you would have done before because the smarts you're bringing, that experience, but like how are you operating differently? We are all owners of this business, both literally, we're all shareholders, but you know, very much in, in terms of attitude and, and so on. And so, yeah, while to your point, while I may be a you know, revenue officer looking after revenue, I'm just as bothered by whether or not we buy the expensive coffee beans or the cheaper coffee beans for the machine and, and everything in between. And, and everyone else should be too for now, you know, because that's the only way we're going to we're going to make it and i think that's a really powerful it's a really powerful thought i genuinely feel like this is my business and and that's a really powerful thing if you can turn up every day and feel like i i don't just have you know i don't just have a share in this business but i actually i'm an owner in this business it's quite a different mental attitude and i think you know with all the the, the, the hyper awareness of you know mental health and other things i think it's a really important part of the way in which people can can actually show up well to work and, and feel passion and energy and excitement about what they're doing, connection to what they're doing. And I think a lot of the challenges people feel at work, I know I certainly did, is when you start to feel that divorce from the purpose, right? Divorce from the from the organization and it's you know, really feeling a sense of ownership over it. It's very hard to stop, but if you can, you can hold on to it, it's incredibly valuable. I'm sure you're going to be very successful and I wish you all the success. Thank you for taking the time uh, to share with us. No problem. It's been great. Thank you for having us. The Business Of is brought to you by the Australian Graduate School of Management at UNSW Business School. 
Those insights shared by Dan Peters are a timely reminder about how the speed and agility of decision making in a startup can provide a mandate for a nimble, action oriented approach to growth and create a resilient culture in the future. It's clear financial services firms are learning valuable lessons in adaptive leadership from leading through successive crises. The capacity to lead with trust, humanity and humility came to light in each of my conversations with today's guests and it's an approach we can all apply to our own endeavours. I'm Emma LaRusso. I'll talk to you next time on The Business Of. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast and want to hear more, search for The Business Of on your favourite podcast app and subscribe.